Well, welcome back to our Bible study again as we continue this week looking in the Gospel of John. And we are looking at the introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ as John the Baptist would introduce him to the world. So we're looking at John chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. As we do that, let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll open this time together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the introduction of Christ to the world as he began his public ministry. And we do pray, Heavenly Father, that you would open our hearts and our eyes to your word. And as we will preach on this on Sunday, prepare our hearts so that this entire week we can meditate on this passage, we can think about this passage, we can pray over this passage and appreciate what our Lord Jesus Christ came to do. So Lord, just guide us and uh, thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now we're going to begin the study of the introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world, the beginning of his public ministry. The Lord had been baptized by John. He was led into the wilderness and he was tempted by uh, Lucifer and his angels. The ministering uh, angels took care of him. And now he comes and John introduces him to the world. John the Baptist, and we read this in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. We're just going to deal with this small passage, but it contains so much as it talks about the introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says this, The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Just two verses. My goodness, there's so much in there. What a wonderful royal introduction we have by John the Baptist for the Lord Jesus Christ. As John was baptizing people unto repentance and people were coming and, and sharing their um, sins and, and confession of sins, he sees Jesus coming now out of the wilderness having succeeded in the temptation, now ready to begin this formal time of public ministry, the three and a half years that was foretold back in Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel foretold the day of the anointed one coming and how three and a half years, or in the middle of that 70th week, the anointed one would be cut off and put an end to sacrifice. And so now we have a time period which truly occurred three and a half years now from the beginning of the Lord's introduction until the day the veil of the temple was split, the day that the sacrificial uh, system ended, the day lo that the Lord Jesus uh, was crucified. And so now John the Baptist introduces the Lord Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. All right. So when John would have said this, surrounded by people who were still coming in from different areas, who were still coming in to be baptized and, and sharing their confession, their confession of their sins, there still would have been a huge crowd uh, with John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And as Jesus came back from the desert, John sees him and he points all the people that were with him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he says, behold, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When John said that, everybody who was with him must have turned their heads and looked because they understood at least the, the, the concept of what he was talking about. They at least understood the basics of what this was, the Lamb of God, a person being called a lamb. But it wasn't John the Baptist saying, behold, a lamb who takes away the sin of the world, because that would indicate 
well, there's a guy who will die or who will be a sacrifice. The key was he was the Lamb of God. That was the key of it. He was a God-provided lamb. And as soon as John puts that uh, clarification to the term, not just saying, behold the lamb, but rather saying, behold the lamb of God, there was an immediate identification in the minds of the people of more than just simply a lamb that they would have continually understood to be uh, something you would pick up in the field and take into the temple to be offered as a sacrifice, to back to a very clear messianic understanding of the Messiah. So let me pull up some Old Testament passages, and we're going to look at that and understand what John the Baptist was really saying. First of all, we need to go back to Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 22, we have the passage here, and I pull this up, of Abraham and the sacrifice of his son, Isaac. And this is what it says. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went up, both of them together, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And so back in Genesis chapter 22, what we have is this story of Abraham and how he was willing to go by faith and sacrifice his only son to the Lord. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 that it was an act of faith, believing that God would raise him up again somehow. But what incredible faith Abraham had to literally go and pick up a knife, believing that it was his job to kill his own son. But just before he did that, the Lord stopped him, and the Lord showed him a ram that was there, and it was that lamb that he took and sacrificed as a substitute, a God-provided substitute for his own son. And so when the children of Israel had this understanding of what the Messiah would be, they understood that it would be a God-provided substitute God somehow, using the passage in Genesis chapter 22, would provide a substitute for ourselves. That God would provide a lamb. God would provide some sort of a God provision lamb who would be a substitute to a sacrifice for my, and to take my place. And they would, they would have understood that from the passage here in Genesis chapter 22. So coming back now to what John the Baptist said, when John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God, the of God would have stirred in their minds, Genesis 22, that this man that was approaching them was God's provisional substitute to take my place in a sacrifice or to take my place in death. And so they didn't really, I'm sure, comprehend the deity of Christ. They did not comprehend the significance of who the Lord Jesus was, but their minds would have been stirred to that. Now, along with that, there were some very clear understandings of what was required. 
And what was required was that the sacrifice had to be unique. Let me pull up some scripture here. And the next time we really get a significant understanding of the work of the Messiah is in the Passover. So in the Passover, in Exodus, the children of Israel, of course, uh, were in that state where uh, God was punishing the Egyptians for keeping them in bondage. And they'd already gone through a number of miracles. And uh, all of the miracles that they had done, the magicians of Pharaoh could duplicate them. And that simply was demonic uh, ability. And it says uh, this in Exodus chapter 12, that one of the, or the really the final demonstration of God's power was that he was going to kill all the firstborn of everyone who was in Egypt unless there was a lamb who would be provided for you to save you from the consequences of death and sin. And so this passage here in Exodus chapter 12 says this, talking about the fact that um, the lamb should be provided it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a lamb a year old. And you'll take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and in the lintel of the house in which they eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt at night. And I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. For on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D is Jehovah or Yahweh or literally the great I am. This is the, the triune nature of God. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so let's just go through exactly what God was saying here in uh, Exodus chapter 12. Moses had the picture of Isaac, the lamb substitute that God provided. Now here at Passover, the children of Israel were in bondage uh, in, in Egypt, and uh, that was because, remember, uh, Joseph uh, was thrown into the well by his brothers, and then they traded him, and he went to Egypt, but God blessed him, and they blessed and blessed and blessed, and they went into the, the, um, the land, and over the years they began to, from the land of Goshen, they began to grow and gather in numbers, and they were successful to the point that the the Israeli, or sorry, the Egyptian people became very jealous of them. And finally, Pharaoh said, enough, enough, uh, and put them into bondage, into slavery. Until such times, they cried out to God, and the Lord raised up Moses. So now here, uh, Moses is telling Pharaoh to let his people go. And every time Pharaoh says yes, then he changes his mind. And so Moses brings a a plague or locust or some sort of thing upon the land. But now uh, this is the final one. Every male firstborn, whether it be beast or animal, uh, beast or, or human, uh, will die unless God provides a covering or a sign for the angel to pass over your house and to keep those inside the house safe. And so the formula that God provided was this. Take a lamb, but the lamb had to be without blemish. In other words, it, it had to have no imperfection. The wool had to be pure white. Uh, it had to be a, a perfectly beautiful, innocent lamb. Now, if you read down in the passage, I'm put back up here. In 1 Peter 1.18, Peter reminds us in the New Testament, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. That's not how you were ransomed out of this 
the life of being spiritually dead, but you were ransomed, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish, blemish or spot. And so that concept of Christ being without blemish or spot was because it, back in the Old Testament in Exodus, foreshadowed the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ would come to this earth and live successfully through the temptations without sin. There'd be no blemish upon Christ. There would be no sin upon Christ. He would succeed the temptations of the evil one. And therefore, as we read in Hebrews, we did in Hebrews chapter 4, that we have a high priest uh, who's gone through the heavens and he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he's been tempted in every way as we, yet without sin. And so that allows us to come boldly unto his throne of grace to receive grace and mercy to help us in our times of need. So the fact that the of the perfection of Christ, that Christ would be fully God and fully man, that he would be a sacrifice who would take my place on the cross and it would be for me only and not for him. In other words, he wasn't dying for himself because he was sinless, was foretold back in the type of lamb that they were to choose in Exodus. The lamb had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect without any defect. And it was a visual reminder to the children of Israel that the coming God provided lamb had to be one without any sort of imperfection upon it. And so when John the Baptist looks at the crowds and says, behold, the lamb of God, the lamb of God, again, their minds would have been stirred to understand that this is a sacrifice. This is a sacrifice provided by God as a substitute and that it was a sacrifice provided by God, who was sinless. Now remember, in the New Testament and all throughout the Old Testament, whenever the, the priest would uh, go and take your lamb and sacrifice that lamb for you, he would wash his hands in that bronze uh, basin, that laver, and it was a polished bronze so that when he looked in it, uh, as he was washing his own hands, washing the blood off his hands, he would see his own reflection and it was to remind him that that sacrifice was for him as well. He too needed to be sacrificed. He too needed to have his sins forgiven. He too was guilty. But the Lamb of God was without blemish. The Lamb of God was not dying for himself. He was my substitute. If I had gone on the cross, if if I said, here, I'll be a lamb and, and, I'll, and I'll die on a cross for you, it would have had no effect because I'm just as sinful as you are. And so I can't really take your place. I cannot be your substitute when I have to be my own substitute. See, I couldn't die to remove your sins when I'm just as bad and just as guilty as you are. So it had to be a substitute that was without blemish. And Peter says that we were redeemed not with silver or gold, not with things of monetary value, but we were redeemed with the blood of the lamb who was out without blemish or spot, the sinless, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human form, the sinless Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why Jesus had to be born by Mary as a virgin, had to be introduced into this world without original sin upon him so he could be fully God and fully human, fully God to be able to forgive my sins and to be introduced without sin and fully man to be my sacrifice and who was sympathetic to my needs and who have who was tempted and yet without sin
And so here is this image where John the Baptist sees the Lord Jesus coming. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. And they would have at least had some understanding of what was meant. Now, in the Old Testament, this was not an uncommon thing. So let me pull up another passage of Scripture here. And here again, it is from Exodus and Hebrews. In Exodus 29, 39, uh, they were told that you were to take one lamb and you shall offer the lamb in the morning and offer another uh, you shall offer at twilight. So every single day, they would be killing a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening. That's a lot of lambs to go through. <laughs> and that's a lot of horrific slaughter and blood. And again, it was to remind the people of Israel that the nature of sin is terrible and that there's a constant need for blood, 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 blood. Again, where do you get that from? Well, we looked at that already. Back in the garden, Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. And God says, no, you don't approach me with things that you've sewn together by your own hands. You only approach me when I provide death and blood to cover you. And so in that very kind of foggy way, uh, it was foretold that we approach God when he provides death and we are covered in blood. Now, they would offer a sacrifice, one in the morning and one in the evening. The amazing thing is that when John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming and says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us this, that in the Old Testament that every priest stands daily in his service offering repeatedly, repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never really take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. That's Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. Now what the writer of the book of Hebrews says, we, we, we always say the writer of the book of Hebrews because we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Okay, uh, some suggest it's Paul, uh, others reject that it is Paul, but we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But regardless, it was somebody who knew the Old Testament system very well. But the writer of the Hebrews reminded us that, yes, in the Old Testament, you would sacrifice a lamb in the morning and an evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, day after 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 day. But when the perfect Lamb of God came, he offered sacrifice once. Because really, killing an animal doesn't really do anything other than God would accept it by faith until such time as the perfect Lamb of God would come. But once the Lamb of God arrived, he offered himself once, completely, and his sinless blood was shed, and the pathway of redemption was provided. And now there's access directly into the throne room of God through the blood of Christ. And when that was provided, the Lord Jesus Christ sat down in his throne in heaven, which means there wasn't a need for repetitive sacrifice because the sacrifice of redemption, the sacrifice that Christ provided is as strong and as clear and as powerful at this moment as it was on the cross. It is complete and powerful. There's no need to do it over and over and over again, morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, because it is complete. And the way of salvation today is as powerful today as it was for your parents, as it was for your grandparents, as it was for uh, your great-grandparents, and all backwards and backwards, and all the way back. It is as powerful as it has ever been, and it will be until the day in which the Lord returns. There is one way of salvation, and it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it cleanses us perfectly, perfectly. 
and it is still in effect with all of its power. Now, the amazing thing in all of this is that just a very quick, and I just pulled some verses up. Let me grab them here. Just a quick cursory reading of the book of Revelations. And the book of Revelations constantly talks about the Lamb. Now again, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. There he is. And the book of Revelations rejoices in the current state. So Revelations 5 says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the sea in under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever not wonderful worthy is the lamb who was slain and so the lord jesus christ maintains that identity forever as god's substitute provided for you forever the lamb and there's other verses there um revelations 21 it says the angel showed me the river and the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne of god into the lamb uh, it, it's just amazing to see that john in his vision uh, of uh, that he received on the Isle of Patmos, constantly the vision of heaven is that of a lamb who was worthy to receive glory and honor for what he did for you and for me and not for himself. Perfect salvation to restore us to the relationship that was lost in the garden that we may have with Christ forever and ever. There's so much more we could teach on the Lamb. But I do want to get to the next phrase here, which says this, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Interesting. Now, we know the Lamb of God takes away sin because it says that. Who was slain? Uh, he provided sacrifice and he sat down. We know that. Well, what is it that John the Baptist was meaning here when he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Well, okay, I'm going to give you three options here. When he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, there are three different options, three different views. One is, he meant that the Lamb of God will take away every sin from every human being who will ever live when he dies on the cross. The other option is, it means that he will take away the sin of the world of the elect. The other option is, he will take away the sins of all groups of people, or at least be adequately able to take away the sins of all groups of people. So which one is the most biblical. There are those and many people who would say, well, that just means that he took away everybody's sin. That the Lamb of God, when he died on the cross, as John would say here, would take away the sin of every human being on the face of the earth. Now, we have a whole bunch of theological problems with that one. Well, first of all, we need to stay in the text and we need to be biblically correct in the way we interpret this and not just kind of go off on a tangent. And I've said this before. I'm going to pull up some scripture here. And the question is this. Does the word world always mean every single person on the earth? Well, let's just look at some other ways. Now, the problem is the English language is so imperfect. When we translate from Greek into English, we have six different Greek words 
cosmos being one of them, that is translated into world. And we have one single English word, world. So everything gets translated to world. And as we as human beings, and, and in today's language, we instantly think world means everybody. So we've got to look at some passages of scriptures and just see how the word world is used in other scripture. Then we'll come back to this passage. Uh, first of all, in Luke 2, it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Well, when Caesar Augustus in Rome decreed that there'd be a census, he wasn't implying that the people in Asia, and there were people in China at that point, um, would have been included, nor the people in South America, uh, nor the people or the natives of North America or the tribes in Northern Asia. So when it said all the world, it meant the known world or the Greek Roman world in that case, okay? In Acts chapter 24, one of the complaints against the apostles was, it says this, for we have found this man a plague who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. Well, again, the apostles were stirring up trouble among the Jews because they were preaching Christ. But again, it wasn't everybody on the face of the earth. The word world here is used to refer to the Greek Roman world or the world in which the Jewish uh, synagogues were, okay? John 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hates me before it hates you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. Now again, if the world hates you, does that mean every single person hates you? Well, no, not every single person hates me because I'm a Christian, but a large unsaved group of people may, a majority of the unsaved world or the unsaved community or unsaved people may, but the world does not in these in this case mean every single person on the face of the earth. Okay? Um, and then we, there's others here in 1 John 3, um, James 2, listen my brothers, God has chosen the God has not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich by faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. Well, not everyone who is poor are rich in faith, or everyone poor in the world are rich in faith. Uh, Ephesians 1 He even though he chose us before the foundation of the world, now that means simply the planet in that case, and not the people of it, the planet rather. And so, um, and, the, and there's other passages there. Um, of course, the Great Commission, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. We extrapolate that command to mean peoples throughout the entire planet. But when you read it in context, Jesus gave it to the disciples alone after his resurrection. And they fulfilled that by Paul's missionary journeys. But we can extrapolate that and bring it out to say, well, if that was true that Jesus commanded the apostles, then how much more true is it for us to go into more of the world that we know exists? So even though, yes, we use that as called the Great Commission for us, uh, biblically it was given specifically by the Lord Jesus to his um, remaining apostles. So all that to say, it's hard to, to jump to the conclusion to say the word world means every single person because even though there are so many different Greek words translated world, there's only one English recipient of those words and we say word and we instantly believe it means everybody. So going back to the text now, I'll pull that back up. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. He says, Behold, the substitute, the Lamb of God, that blameless, sinless Lamb. 
of God. You know, Isaiah um, talks about Christ in Isaiah 53 as the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if it if you're going to take this to mean he takes away the sin of every single human being, then we ask ourselves, if the sin of every single human being has been paid for by the blood of Christ, if the sin of every single human being has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, if the sins of every single human being has fulfilled propitiation or satisfied the righteous anger of God by the blood of Christ, then nobody can go to hell. Nobody can go to hell. There would be nobody in hell and nobody could go to hell because in the eyes of a holy God, when he looks at anybody, he sees everybody as having their sins washed forgiven and removed by the blood of Christ. So then there is no hell. Everyone is saved. Now, to be fair, those who would hold it means a, a, a universal message of um, the world, they would say, yeah, hold it now. You still have to accept it. And the argument with that is, okay, so Christ has washed the sins of every human being away, but that doesn't guarantee you go to, go to heaven. You still have to accept it. The problem with that is, how do you accept it if you're spiritually dead? Because Romans 3 says, there is nobody that seeks God, not even one, for all have turned away and all have become useless. Well, they reject total depravity. That's the key. They come back to the point that human beings are spiritually neutral, right? We're back to the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other. And we're spiritually neutral. Sin in the garden did not spiritually kill me, even though Ephesians 2 says, for by nature we are dead in our trespasses and sins. They reject that. And they say, we're spiritually neutral. I have the free will in and of myself without the prompting of the Holy Spirit to choose God or to reject God. It's all my decision. And what Christ did on the cross was this. He didn't actually die for my sins on the cross. He just died to make salvation available. It's available. And now it's up to me to decide whether I want it or not. And I always say, it's like going to the Mandarin for Chinese food. You go to the Mandarin and there's all the buffet laid out before you. And the the uh, the host uh, puts the chicken balls in one tray and the chop suey in another tray and, you know, this in another tray. And then they just step back. And now it is entirely up to me to choose what I want. I am free to choose this or choose that. And the host just stands there and watches because they've provided it and they can't do anything more than just step back and watch and see what happens. And that is truly their view of salvation. Salvation is that Christ provided the salvation for everybody and now he just steps back and sees who gets it, who wants it. It's all up to you. You choose it, you don't choose it. But the, the reality is that's salvation by works. There is human works in that. That is not salvation by grace. There is no prompting of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it even changes the way I pray for people. I believe that we need to pray earnestly for the salvation of the lost. But what that would end up with is, Lord, I pray that my, my friend Bob makes wise decisions. That's all you end up praying for. Rather than, Lord, I pray that you would open his heart, open his spiritual eyes, and draw him by your spirit and by your grace, 
and humble him and bring him to salvation. You don't pray like that. You end up praying that he'll make a good decision and that he'll choose God. In fact, it changes the way you do evangelism completely because now you're just trying to logically get them to the place to make the right choice as opposed to revealing that they are sinners before a holy God. So the univer universalistic viewpoint in this, which was held by so many Christian denominations, just leads you down an entire humanistic pathway of salvation. I believe these people are genuinely saved. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ, but they honestly have never thought through where it leads them theologically, and it ends up with humanism. It really does. It does not end up with salvation by grace. It ends up with my choice to choose God or to reject God. Um, and that's it. So, coming back to John here, do I... Do I personally believe uh, that this means the world of the elect? The answer is, no, I don't believe it's that view either. Why? Why don't I believe that? Well, because it doesn't fit the context, that's why. I'm trying to be honest to the scripture here. And when John spoke this, do, do I believe John was saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the elect? No, I don't think John was saying that. Because John had just saw the Pharisees and the, uh, come to him. And remember he said, you know, oh, you uh, vipers, who warned you, right? And then he says to them, God could raise up um, uh, Israelites out of these stones. He was trying to get them to realize that you're not unique. Just because you're Jewish, it doesn't mean that you have a special place in God's program of salvation. What I think it really means is this. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all peoples of the world. More than just the Jews, but he's, he's the salvation, he is the provider of salvation for people who come and repent, whether you're Asian or whether you're black or whether you're white uh, or whatever your nationality is, whatever your background is. He's not just the the Lamb of God for the Jewish people. He's the Lamb of God that is provided for all peoples of the world. I think that's the, the in context, I think that is the, the best understanding of who takes away the sin of the world. World meaning all nationalities who has been provided. Now, I will say this, the death of Christ is sufficient for all peoples of the world. In other words, there's nobody, no individual on the face of the earth that can say, you know, his death on the cross isn't enough for me. And I would say, no, it is sufficient for you. It is sufficient for you. So certainly the blood of Christ and the Lamb of God is sufficient for all men. But I believe in this context, in the passage that John is talking about here, that he, when he says, who takes away the sin of the world, I believe he means the sin of all groups of people. Now, certainly the elect of all groups of people, but all groups of people. So he is the salvation for the Jews. He is the salvation for the Arabs. He is the salvation for the Asians. He is the salvation for, you know, uh, everybody, all nationalities who would come to him in brokenness, led by the Spirit of God, repenting of their sins, and coming to salvation. Wow, that's one verse, and we do have another verse to look at, but I think we're out of time. Um, again, the second verse, really quickly, the second verse, uh, who comes after me, remember John the Baptist was six months older, and yet he's saying that Jesus came before him, which is really the incarnation of Christ, that, that he is the eternal one. So, so <laughs> that's the really fast answer for verse 30. Um, but anyhow, what a wonderful thing that John the Baptist introduces the Lord Jesus that much. I should do another, I don't know how long we we're into this now, but um, 45 minutes on one verse, and we could do a lot more. But what a wonderful thing as we look forward to worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the lamb who is sufficient 
for our sins, who's alive today, who's reigning on the throne of God over all things, and he is worthy to receive glory, honor, power, and praise. All right? Lord bless you all, and uh, we look forward to a wonderful worship on Sunday when we lift up the name of Christ together, and uh, we're excited to worship him, right? We're excited to worship him. All right, Lord bless you all. Bye-bye.